the God of the family. Uh, C.S. Lewis, one of the great Christian authors, really, of all time, wrote an allegory. It was called The Great Divorce. It examines why people choose either heaven or hell. In it, he features a reunion between a woman who is entering into heaven and her son had preceded her in death. And she is actually uh, upset, if not uh, resents the fact that he's not the one to welcome her into eternal life. He's really drawing the important point of understanding that you can't love a fellow creature fully till you love God completely. And that's, that's our thesis tonight. Again, with the things of God, this has been so emphasized in my spirit this week. Again, with God, it's not a choice of either or. With God, it's always about the order. If he's first, everything lines up. Everything works out. You get everything. Seek first and all these things are added, you know. It's the order that determines whether we're on it or we're not. Whether we are in harmony with the word of God or we're just fumbling, bumbling, stumbling around, if you will. To give us uh, another metaphor to think of life as a... Uh, uh, as a bicycle wheel uh, that has many spokes and each one could be assigned a relationship of spouse or children or uh, siblings, whatever the case may be. And some of us might erroneously try to assign God a spoke and we feel so good about it. You know, Jesus, you're the real shiny one. You know? Well, no, Jesus isn't able to be a spoke. Jesus is the hub from which all the spokes emanate. See the difference? It's a big difference. It's huge. Our, our, our tendency, while it is, I think, sincere, is just to think of him, you know, as part of this big picture. But really, there's God, and then there is everything else. We're called to love all the family relationships that the Lord makes available to us. They are his design. They're a part of us. But all of those relationships, every one of them, have to be in a context of our devotion to God himself. He must be our deepest love. Actually, the source of every other love. Amen. And only when we love God properly can we love others correctly. And that's going to be a recurring theme tonight. The Ten Commandments are very clear. We honor our parents in that family context, but we worship God. Another metaphor for you, how about a top button truth? If you've ever been hurrying to get dressed, it's always when you're in a hurry. Or if you, you don't want to turn on the lights and wake everybody else up, and, and you're trying to, to button a shirt or a blouse or whatever, and you get to the bottom and you realize, whoops, the, the top one is off. And, and I have just locked up trying to, you know, ah! I, I can't even figure out how to unbutton them. Because I got off on the wrong one. The, the top one wasn't in place, so the rest of them are doomed. Well, so it is. God has got to be the top button. Somebody say amen. Things that are out of order initially can never end up correct. That's why math was so deadly to me. I would make my mistakes right at the beginning, which meant the end was hopeless. God has ordered our lives in such a way that devotion to him is the top button. Okay? So think about that as we prepare moving forward. If that relationship is in proper order, then you're going to find that everything else really lines up well and works in harmony. But if it's off, well, the rest are going to suffer. There's going to be that lack of alignment, that fail, if you will. Augustine, an early church father, called it disordered love. 
legitimate objects of love and affection that have fallen as much out of order as a misbuttoned shirt. The reality of the necessity and power of these relationships is where they can go wrong. They're very compelling. They're very powerful. They're very demanding. They're a great sense of assignment. And I, I would submit to you in our everyday lives, they are to be dominant. Not just, you know, career and things, but people, the, the relationships we have. But I can't love any less. And, and I'm not telling you to love any less. Please hear that. I don't want you to go home and, well, kids, it's not going to be the way it's always been. I don't love you as much as I did yesterday. Pastor said, we've got to love Jesus first, so you all are dropping down a notch, you know. Then they'll all hate me, and that just wouldn't be good. I'm not saying that. We, we don't love each other less, but we can love each other differently. We can love each other in that context that you know, I can't be any closer to my wife than I am to the Lord because he's the author. He designed all these relationships and my love, my devotion, my, my investment in my children, all those things are made better when Jesus is first. For our text tonight, uh, I want you to turn to Genesis 22. It is a very <laughs> intense chapter. It's one that I... Uh, and, and you are very familiar with, but I haven't really gone through it uh, like we're going to this week. Beginning verse 1, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering, as one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. This is amazing. Next day, right off the bat, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, so... This is quite a journey. I would venture to say it's kind of like a, a, a funeral procession, if you will. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And now's where it's going to get dicey. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, well, that's why I put a dotted line on your neck last night. No, he didn't say that. That's why I brought this Sharpie. So I, do. I just had to get some relief there. This is just, this is vexing. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Can you get your head around this kind of scenario? Unbelievable. When they come to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The procedure would to be to smite the juggler vein. It was painless. It was instant death. That's how the sacrifice went. But the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Now, by nature's design and God's providence, 
a ram's horns can't get caught in a thicket because of the curve and the, the design. So this is truly God's provision. And Abraham went and took the ram. Don't you know he went and took the ram? He got a hold of that thing and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offering shall possess the gate, offspring shall possess the gate of the enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Man, there's a lot going on here. What if you and I were asked to prove that our love and commitment to God was greater than anything or anyone? Abraham, pretty important guy. These last few words from the angel are a reiteration of the initial promise God made to Abraham when he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham, you're the guy. I'm going to start a whole new nation of people, my people. And through you comes all the blessings. I'm going to change the world through you, Abraham, and through your descendants. Now, an important caveat is to understand that Abraham and Sarah have no children. Sarah cannot have children. It's quite a promise. It's a promise entirely based on the miracle that they will have a child. And they didn't handle it very well in the sense of the obvious. Sarah's 90. Excuse me, she's much younger. She's 80. And Abraham's a spry 90. Well, you know, at that point in life... Um, Surprises of children is probably not a concern. Now we're getting on nervous ground. Just relax. But let us just say that Abraham and Sarah aren't really, they don't use the do not disturb sign a lot. Okay. I, I'm neither 80 nor 90, but I'm guessing. I do know that gravity is the cruelest form on earth. And, well, you know. So the whole idea of having a baby, come on. When he told Sarah, she laughed. God's going to give us a son. Yeah, right. Look at you. Yeah, well, look at yourself. <laughs> Don't you know it was a great conversation? And they really didn't handle it well. You know, God wrote the check, but they thought they had to help him cash it. So at some point, Sarah says, look, look, hey, it's, it's, it's not happening. Um, why don't you take Hagar? You can have a child with her. That wasn't that uncommon within the culture and within the time. And uh, they did. Ishmael is conceived. Abraham loved Ishmael. He was his son. That wasn't the promise. The promise was not the seed of Abraham. The promise was to Abraham and Sarah. The promise was for the miraculous, that a woman who had been barren would bear a child beyond childbearing years. That's quite a check. And guess what? If God writes it, he can cash it. Amen. Amen. God, you know, God's promises, I hope they're beyond me. They're God's promises. And I'm, I'm just glad to be a part of them and, and, and to cooperate. And so, God love them. <laughs> they meant well. But look at the mess they made. Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. Isaac, the father of the Hebrews. The world has suffered. Because two folks couldn't trust God to keep his promise. That's a side note. And now back to our regularly scheduled study. 
You know, he's going to test old Abraham in a couple of ways. Number one, ask him to have faith in the promise that he and his wife will have a child. And then number two, it's about 10 years later. He is now 100 and she is 90. Beautiful. And sure enough, Isaac is born. But guess what? That's not really the final test. That's just the midterm. Final test, we just read it, verse 2. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. It's interesting. This is the first time the word love is used in the Bible. When God tells Abraham to take the son that he loves and prove that he loves him more. And God understood exactly what he's asking. Now, let me assure you, God never has, never will, ask for, sanction, or accept human sacrifice. The book of Deuteronomy is filled with clear directives condemning the practice among the Canaanites and the barbarous people around Israel. But when Abraham's walking to Moriah, Deuteronomy hasn't been written. So he doesn't know that God doesn't do this. He just knows what God has said. We all know the love of a parent to a child. It's pretty amazing, pretty incredible, especially that first one. You know, it's, it's just wonderful. You, you beg God to help them go to sleep. And then after they're asleep, you go in to make sure they're still alive. You know, put your finger under their nose or whatever, and they, they're sleeping so good. I, I need to wake them up so they can scream some more, you know, and you just dote over everything, little sniffle, little fever. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, and by the time you get to two or three projectile vomiting, no big deal, you know. Just, just grab a bucket and hold on, you know. Hallelujah. But the unthinkable take this miracle and put it on the altar. Give him back. Here's the deal. Life's greatest gifts can become life's greatest tests. You know, I, I look at this story and it, it turns a lot of memories of my sainted father he used this story a lot. Now, a little side note, major props to Isaac. Uh, from what we can tell, Isaac's probably in his middle teens, 14, 15 years old. I guarantee you he could take the 100-year-old dad. Say, Dad, God love you. You've lost it. I am not going to lay on this altar, and you are not going to slit my throat because I am the promise of God. You know. But from what we can tell, I love Isaac. He just, he lets his dad tie him up, put him on the altar. He's laying there. The knife is in the air, precious ones. This is not, you know, and I'm sure Abraham's probably thinking any time now, God, you can step in and haven't I gone far enough? Haven't I proved enough to you, Lord? Everybody's got an Isaac, everybody. I won't always say it's your firstborn, but it's something that has to go on the altar because the one thing God's got to know is that he is number one. And if he's not, then he's going to ask for it. Okay. But my dad would say, well, as long as I keep you on the altar, you're safe. I'm thinking, bro, if you ever break out a knife, we got a problem. If you think we're going to have a little reenactment here, no, nah, Baba, no, nah. I am not the son of promise, even though mom and dad called themselves Abraham and Sarah. No, we're not, we're not no, no Moriah reenactments. Hallelujah. You know, in stories, we, we relate, we become the characters. And in this story, nobody wants to be Abraham. Are you kidding me? We know what it's like to adore our children, each one special, wonderful, a miracle. We give our lives in a heartbeat. It wouldn't even be a thought. It's not just about our children, though. Who do we love so fiercely, so protectively, so desperately? 
that we would lay down our life. The more beautiful a thing is, the greater its capacity to become that small G-O-D. It's not that those things are evil. They're not. The enemy just, his agenda is to put another God in front of the God. To somehow allow something that we make into something bigger than the Lord. The more beautiful that thing is, the, the greater the danger. The more I fear losing it, the more likely I am to worship it. Abraham was wealthy, but, you know, walking away from Ur of the Chaldees, from what I could find, Ur of the Chaldees was a fine town now. The everyday flatware was pure gold. It, he had a wonderful life. And he loads up and takes off and doesn't even know where he's going. But that wasn't the test. This is the test. Verse 5, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Two key words here, worship. That word tells us everything we need to know about Abraham. It tells us about his journey of faith. Remember, this isn't the guy who can believe that he's going to be a dad initially. But wait, wait and see where he's come now in his journey. But worship, choosing God above everything and everyone, that's worship. That's worship. God first. And look where Abram has become. So how do you do that, man? Was Abraham sick? Was he Twisted in some way? No. Abraham believed God. Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I mean, he understands. Okay, the kid's a miracle, and the kid is the deal. Everything hinges on Isaac. There's no other children. He's the deal. So, you know, it, it doesn't get any bigger than that. Verse 19, Abraham considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. I'm telling you, that is powerful. The one who couldn't believe that he would be able to have a son now believes that if God does let this happen, he's going to bring him back to life. Whew. That's why they call him the father of the faithful. That's just incredible. Is Isaac a disordered love? And I say no. No idols in the form of anything, not even in the form of a beloved child are acceptable. George Barna has done probably more research in surveying evangelicals and trying to get a handle on where we are uh, in our faith versus our community and our society. He had a stat that seven out of 10 adults actually put their earthly families before God. That's not good. Because disordered loves are very problematic. You know, our children may not be a matter of uh, them being too much of a priority, but they may just be controlling us. Now, granted, they're high maintenance for a while, like 30 years. <laughs> I don't, Kristen, are you here? No, they're all, Chris and Kate are both home with sick babies, so I'm going to throw all my girls under the bus tonight. You're going to love it. Their behavior determines our view of life, whether it's good or bad. I feel like such a success sometimes and other times an utter fail. They have the power to fill life with anger or peace, disappointment or joy. Little devils. They control who we are as a person, who we become over time. And that's exactly what a false god does. It recreates us in its own image. You know, just as a quiz coach, I've thought, Lord, my, my emotional well-being is in the hands 
of teenagers. This can't be good. Can't be healthy. There's got to be a better way <laughs> to minister to people. Because, boy, sometimes I just celebrate him, and other times I'm looking for a knife. Amen. Jesus says, you must die. Amen. <laughs> just kidding. You hear Angel laughing hysterically in, in affirmation of that. Praise God. And that's what we've got to be careful of. When relationship has control on our mindset and on our emotions, it may be an indication that God is being replaced. That's where you have to be careful. Let's look at the New Testament, Luke 14, beginning at verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I'll stop with that verse, Patty. Now, these verses cannot be taken out of context. Because if they do, we're really going to miss the point. Number one, verse 27 sums it up. That there's something for everybody. There's a crucible. There's a price. There is an Isaac that has to be offered or we are willing to offer. I will say that most of the time in my life, it's kind of been that Abraham principle. When I came to grips with, okay, God, I'll do that. I'll submit to that. I'll, I'll give that. I'll go there. I'll make that change or whatever. And then God says, you don't have to. I was just checking. Just seeing if you would. Uh, and I'm very thankful when that happens. But this context here is very important. And I will say to you that this passage has been taken out of context in teaching here at Calvary uh, in years past. That there were some that told some of our young adults that to be closer to God, they had to get more distant from their parents. And friends, that's not what, what this is talking about. And uh, the whole counsel of Scripture is very clear, to love our families, honor. It's the only commandment with promise. Now, Jesus isn't going to offer teaching that is in opposition to the commandments. Everybody say amen. amen. So what does it mean? In Jewish culture, hate really is an expression of a lesser love. The New Living Translation really kind of nails it. You must hate everyone else by comparison. Not to sever earthly relationships as a way to get closer to God. It's not about loving people less. It's about loving God more. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you come talk to me and I will make it very plain to you. Because, you know, context is so important. And people that don't offer it, well, there, there's two things going. Either there's a lack of education and information, or there's an agenda of manipulation. And none are acceptable. And I'm telling you, somebody starts weighing in and counseling about your family and your earthly relationships. Two questions. What kind of relationships do they have with their family? Because if they're broken, if they're dysfunctional, or they were non-existent, they're going to bring that. That's the lens. That's their hermeneutic to the conversation. It's, it's just a fact. And I, I just want us to be very careful here. And I agree with exactly what the Lord is saying. And, and it's a win-win. The more I love him, the better I love them. Amen. With wisdom, not with heartbreak, not with division, not with uh, things that are, are hurtful and chaotic. So I, I pray the Lord help us that uh, a relationship that is disordered and takes God's 
place is ultimately destructive. And as we conclude here tonight, let me give you four negative consequences of disordered love. Number one is unrealistic expectations. You know, you really, you want to ask someone to be God to you? Is that fair? I worship the ground they walk on. They're my whole world. I've got them on a pedestal. Their mood is my mood. Oh boy, that could be dicey. And guess what? They're going to feel that burden and it's not going to be magical. When disordered love gets onward and becomes idolatry, it places a terrible strain uh, on a marriage or any relationship. They, they can't have a bad day. They can't miss filling every need. And you're going to think, this marriage isn't working. And it's because you're delirious. You know, you, you got to be able to make it on your own. And, and they, comp, they complete you. They complement you. But they don't define you or make you. When I have a bad day, Jeannie's still sweet. When she has a bad day, and there's lots of them, I'm still Mr. Happy People. Although it's harder. Okay. Number two, unreachable expectations. Children under great duress because the bar is set so high. Comparing our kids. Living through our kids. I didn't, but you will. Oof. Helicopter parents, they just hover. All the time. And they've got missiles and... All kinds of things, you know. Thank you. My life is my children. Well, that's not good for anybody. Not good for the kids, not good for you. Adults who are miserable, there's lots of them, because they could never measure up. They were never quite smart enough, athletic enough, didn't quite win enough or achieve enough. Come on, folks, back up a little bit. Placing your value and finding your identity in your child puts that child in God's place in your life. And that is not acceptable. Number three, unreasonable disappointment. If I am constantly critical of others for the emptiness that I feel, if I'm always blaming somebody else, then I'm going to have a hard time in ever having my needs met and ever feeling complete. Sure, these wonderful people, they can give love and satisfaction and fulfillment, but not like what the Lord can give. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. You, you know my commitment to, to family. It is paramount. It is the, the driving force of the Calvary Church. Here we are in the last week of family month. What a month it has been. Such a ministry, such focus, such resources. It, it has been phenomenal. We have invested hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars in making families better. But like I said at the beginning, what, what's going to make it really work? It's what we do with what we have learned and heard and experienced moving forward. The changes we know that, man, we need to do something different. We need to do something better. We need to do something biblical. Amen. I mean, God love our, our precious children, I'm so proud of my girls. They're amazing. They're wonderful. They're gifted. They're talented. They're expensive. They're wonderful. But they've had their moments. We'll go in young to old of moments that were great embarrassments. Ready? <laughs> Kate, my God, Kate, let's just say, Avery, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And you put that with a strong strand of Sizemore and my God of heaven and earth. But her mom used to do that. We'd be at a restaurant. Kate would get down and wander off and be talking to people at their tables. Having a few fries. I mean, you know, waitresses would, is this your child? Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, you kind of lose track of everybody at this point. But it was just amazing. She would... 
She had no boundaries. It was just lunacy. Kedrin, God love Kedrin, pretty sweet person as a rule. Well, there was an adult who was correcting her at the Calvary Church, and she called him a fool. Well, that wasn't good. I, what, what I want to do is take my child and have her apologize. Oh, thanks, Kedrin. Real highlight. But Candace? Oh. oh, Candace. You know, I asked the brunette, the family historian, Jean, what was the most embarrassing things that her child did? So she helped me come up with this list. Candace, when we first moved in <laughs> to the house where the girls grew up, she would walk into neighbors' homes. Just walk in. Not that she was invited. She would walk in. And one day, somebody finally brought her to us because she had let their dog out. They were very upset. Are you kidding me? Just out of control. And of course, then there was Kristen, and she was perfect. Because she was the firstborn. And uncorrupted by her siblings. No, really, we, we couldn't think of anything uh, that, that she did. But, so she's not here for the props. Amen. Then finally, our unfair comparisons. I'm not happy. Other people are happy. Why can't you make me happy? She makes him happy. Oh, boy. This isn't going to go well. When we set our hearts on our family, we make all of these mistakes we finally end up hurting them we hold them to an impossible standard it's a terrible mistake that creates all kinds of resent resentment and bitterness and it, it can really spiral into some problems so on the altar dad was right we can't expect things or people to fill a void that only god can fill Amen. I've been disappointed in myself and every other human being I've ever had any contact with. But I've never been disappointed in the Lord. Never have. How should we look at our family relationships? Do we love less? No, no. We don't love less. We love differently. We put God first. Amen. We love differently. I was reminded, my dad made a statement you know, he and mom kind of set the gold standard for grandparenting. And I remember dad saying, and I thought, oh my God, he's, he is just losing it here. He said, you know, son, I look at these girls and I just fear idolatry. I said, well, dad, that's ridiculous. Well, that's exactly what I'm teaching. That they can become too important, too big, too manipulative, too dominating. We need that balance. Top button, remember? God and all the other things line up. When Jesus is the Lord of my life, I, I'm better at everything. Amen. I place myself in a position to receive God's blessing in my relationship. So, our idol ID, your homework, your reflection, if you will. What person or people matter most to you in the world? Okay? And is there a relationship in your life that seems to determine your, your state of mind, your well-being, your emotional stability? Can you find signs of disordered love in family and the relationships that come from God, but the enemy wants to, to mess them up? Amen.